Gotta say I'm proud of y'all for putting this thing together. David Simon is the author of two seminal pieces of journalism, both the source of innovative television shows. Homicide, A Year in the Killing Streets, became the basis for a television series of the same title. The second book, The Corner, is an examination of the crack and heroin trade in an East Baltimore neighborhood. And after a huge reception of the book, it became the basis for two HBO productions. Firstly, the semi-documentary miniseries, also called The Corner, and second, the, the drama now filming its fourth season, The Wire. Tonight, David's been kind enough to take time out of The Wire's production schedule to come to talk to with us about the show. We're extremely grateful for that. I'd like to start with the first clip of the opening moments of The Corner. We'll then ask David, or rather my students who are sitting in the front row, we'll then ask David to speak to some of the question that these opening scenes pose to the class. Then we'll look at some other clips and have some other questions from the class. When we're done, or when David refuses to do any more, we'll have, <laughs> we'll have some time for questions from the audience. And then we'll welcome you for a reception in the room right next door. So. I just do have to give a warning to some of you who might not be familiar with The Wire, though I don't think there are many of you here, that this is a show with extremely vulgar language. So if you're going, if you're going, it's part of the show's realism, and if you're going to be offended by the language, I suggest that you begin to cover your ears pretty soon. So here's the first, the first clip, the opening um, scene of The Corner. Gary, how long have you been shooting dope? Oh, hardcore, about four years. And you're old, how old now? 34. Hey, you started kind of late. Yeah, well, you know, I didn't mess with these drugs for the longest time. Now, everyone in the neighborhood says things were going very well for you. You worked two full-time jobs. Yeah, plus a home development company I started on the side, yeah. You drove a Mercedes-Benz. Yeah, things was going good. So why'd you start shooting heroin? You're going to give me a cigarette. I need a cigarette. Aaron, you have the first question. First, The Corner, originally a work of journalism in print. Um, why the transition from that medium to from page to screen? Well, anything will go from print to screen if they pay you money. I mean, <laughs> I, I would have sold the book to, to a third party uh, because, in effect, it, you know, there's not a lot of money in, in, in narrative journalism. And if you can sell the screen rights, you're going to... I mean, I sold Homicide. Um, to, to mildly correct that very kind introduction, um, I was not directly involved in the making of Homicide until its later seasons. Um, it was, that was a Tom Fontana, Barry Levinson production, and they really did wield creative control. I sold them the book. Um, so, you know, why, why do it? It's going to get done. If, if somebody wants to do it, the author will always sell, or invariably. It's very rare when the author will not, um, because, you know, it's, it's hard getting paid as a writer. Um, but why did, did I want to do it? I, I saw it as a means of uh, listen, the corner was well received critically, but it, it wasn't exact. You know, it may have sold 50, 60,000 copies. It didn't sell an extraordinary amount. Um, and the book, the book sort of lives for me as a separate thing from from the show. Now, like, the corner was, I think, a more accurate depiction of that book than Homicide was of Homicide. Um, which is not to say that Homicide wasn't a good television drama, but. Um, but invariably, they're all sort of stepchildren to me. The journalism is the journalism, and it's sort of the, 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 the point of origin. But I had, because I had the re resume of having worked on Homicide the last few seasons, I could at least get a meeting with people at HBO. And a broadcast network would have never touched the corner. But um, I'd seen what Tom Fontana, who was the uh, major domo on Homicide, had done with Oz prior to that. And Oz was such a stark show and so much different from what you'd seen before. That was the beginnings of HBO drama, really, was Oz. That was the first, uh, their, their first uh, real attempt. At, and it really paved the way. And so once I'd seen that, uh, I had a meeting with them. And I, it was the only meeting I had. I didn't think that I could go anywhere else with the corner and have it credibly. There was no way NBC or ABC was going to do it. So it was a one-shot meeting. Do you guys, and do you guys want to do this? And, and they stayed with it long enough that eventually uh, uh, some scripts got written and a team formed around it. But in a way, in the beginning, what it is is you're really just trying to extend the, the shelf life of, literally the shelf life of your book. You know, it's, it's, the, the, it's so hard to sell books in America because people don't read. And so, uh, I mean, 
Homicide sold 30,000 in hardback, maybe, um, and another 20 in, in trade paperback, and then the show came on the air. And by the time the show finished its run, it sold like 400,000 in paperback. It's like, oh, if there's a TV show about it, I'll read it. You know, so that's, that's, the, that's the economy of scale as a writer. So if you can get your stuff made by, if you can get a bad movie made about your book, um, you're going to do it. So, Megan, you had a question about the, the book version and the screen version in the corner. Why the switch in the series to a person of color as the narrator? At the beginning and the end of each hour of the corner, there were these interviews, a long interview and then a shorter interview at the end by Charles Dutton, who was the director. Um, and the questions were actually scripted. Uh, it was the, that, that was acting. The actor playing Gary was conveying details of Gary's life. Uh, that was a device that we used because one of the things about film it, that, that uh, one of the things that I find uh, disconcerting in telling stories on film is voiceover. And voiceover, is, voiceover or long passages of historical exposition are the only ways to convey certain facts that are not immediately on screen about character. For example, there was an interview at the end of one of the episodes with, with a, one of the cops in the neighborhood. And the, it was a place where the narrator could say, you know, you keep locking these people up, but you, know, you locked up 30,000 guys in Baltimore last year, but Maryland only has 20,000 jail cells. That you could never ask in the rest of the piece, which had no voiceover and had no narrator. The narrator disappears after that, that thing comes up, what we just saw, credit or titles, and then you're into a story that has no narration, that is all character-driven narrative. So, I mean, I, I guess I was never going to have David Simon in the piece. I wouldn't, you know, that, I mean, I don't have the sonorous voice of, of Charles Dutton. He's an actor and a very good one. But more than that, um, I, I wouldn't have even had a narrator at all in, in the corner, except that when the piece was done, the other uh, writer, my friend David Mills, and I looked at it and said, you know, there's no way to convey who Gary was before and, and some of his history, and there's no way to convey the flummery of the war on drugs, and there's no way to convey um, who this person was before they, I mean, because Gary appears to you as a heroin addict, but Gary had a whole life before that, and one of the things that we really resented um, about the way the people were treated um, in life was that, that it was almost like they didn't exist before they were, they were drug addicts, like they had no, it was impossible to connect their earlier worth. So it's just a device. It's, it's, it's a little bit more graceful than, 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 than voiceover. I'm going to move on, if you don't mind, to the opening scene of The Wire. Um, this is the very first um, uh, scene you see before the credits of the first episode. This kid whose mama went to the trouble of christening him Omar Isaiah Betts. You know, he forgets his jacket. So his nose starts running and... Some asshole, instead of giving him a Kleenex, he calls him snot. <laughs> so he's snot forever. Doesn't seem fair. Life just be that way, I guess. So, who shot snot? I ain't going to no court. Ain't have to put no cap in him, though. No. Definitely not. I mean, he could have just whipped his ass like we always whip his ass. Well, I agree with you. He's gonna kill Snot. Snot been doing the same shit since I don't know how long. Kill a man over some bullshit. Like I'm saying. And every Friday night, we in the alley behind the cut rate, we rolling bones, you know? I mean, all the boys from around the way, and we roll to late. Alley crap game, right? Like every time, he Snot. It fade a few shooters, play it out to the pots deep, snatch and run. What, every time? Couldn't help itself. Let me understand you. Every Friday night, you and your boys will shoot crap, right? And every Friday night, your pal Snot Boogie, he'd wait till there was cash on the ground, then you'd grab the money and run away? You let him do that? I mean, we'd catch him and beat his ass, but ain't nobody never go past that. I gotta ask you, 
If every time Snap Boogie would grab the money and run away, why'd you even let him in the game? What? I mean, Snap Boogie always stole the money. Why'd you let him play? Got this America, man. Um, that story about Snap Boogie is true. <laughs> that happened. That was, that's in the book Homicide. Um, Terry McLarney tells that story better than, than I do. And uh, that whole story of Snap Boogie was beautiful. And it's there as a metaphor for the drug war that you're about to witness. And it's basically saying uh, what the guy says very, you know, that, that amuses McNulty to no end is you got to let him play. It's America, which is a very true thing, which is to say uh, you didn't include these people in your social or political or economic framework out in West Baltimore. And they created their own powerful economic engine using what was illegal, what was denied. Um, so it was a whole metaphor for the season. And all, you know, we try to do that with the first teaser of every season. Adam. Why did you decide to turn from the journalistic realism of the corner, which is pretty much a lot of it is straight from the book, to like the heavily dramatized approach of The Wire? And uh, why did you start the whole thing with this this encounter. Okay. Well, um, the corner was a microcosm of of the uh, addict culture and the drug culture, and in some sense, uh, sort of the, the twelve step recovery culture. It was framed around the microcosm of, of a single broken family, and in that, you could tell very intimate and emotional stories about individuals, and you could sort of humanize the drug culture in ways that were valuable. But one thing you couldn't do without it starting to seem, and in fact, the only places where you could even touch on it were those interviews at the beginning and end of the corner. You couldn't speak to the policy failure that the drug war was through the corner. You can't do it because it's too, uh, it's too overarching a theme to sustain itself on a single corner in West Baltimore. If you have characters that start to, discuss in serious terms the failure of drug policy while they're ch running around chasing you know, a blast or trying to get high or trying to avoid getting beat by the cops, it, it's inherently false because nobody's doing that. They're trying to get through the day. So that would, it would have been a lie to try to bend the story, the intimate story of the McCullough family to address social political issues. Um, and at the same time, uh, I finished the corner feeling, and Ed Burns felt, having finished the book, that there were things about the drug war and about the way America pursues its policy of drug prohibition almost with, with almost a blithe disregard to the, um, to the realities of it, that there was no, those were the parts of the corner, that, that the parts of the book that could never, and, and were not portrayed in the corner. So The Wire was really an attempt not so much to be intimate with all the characters the same way the corner was it was an attempt to, to tell the story of a of an america that got left behind and why it got left behind who shot the young man look i don't i don't know i don't think it was us the mother niggas was going wild though I mean, you know the cops it's going to have to bang some heads on this one they got to that means we got to shut everything down until this shit passed. That means the towers, the low rises, everything got to take a long fucking time out. I know, Strang. I'm sorry, man. Let me tell you something, man. This here game is more than the rep you carry the corner you hold. You gotta be fierce, I know that. But more than that, you gotta show some flex. Give and take on both sides. You hear me? Yeah. All right, anything that fired a bullet out on that corner has gotta disappear, you understand me? I'm not talking about the storm drains. Corner nigga Shamrock can drive all that crumb over to the harbor. The Wire was really an attempt to tell the story not of Avon Barksdale or Jimmy McNulty or Omar Little or any of these people, but to tell the story of a city 
and specifically the part of a city that's been left behind and betrayed. So if, if that's, I mean, the star of the, that's the way I should say it, the star of the wire is, is West Baltimore, or second season, the docks, you know, uh, Southeast Baltimore. It's the parts of Baltimore that have not been exalted or, uh, um, you know, or offered a future. That's the star, as opposed to the character playing, the character that's Gary McCullough or DeAndre McCullough. To what do we owe the honor? Just checking in. Why, you got something going on? No, nothing too sexy, just pushing the case uphill inch by inch on Kentel Williamson, our stated target. We're working too, Lester. Yeah, on your own thing. You even listen to me, McNulty? I got a real case to bring in. A fellow named of Stringer Bell. You might have heard of him, I don't know. You got a mouth on you, boy. He's still out there, Lester. He's got his corners, his money. Fuck it, by now, for all you know, he's got all that downtown real estate. Motherfucker probably owns half Baltimore without his even knowing it. That ain't the point. You even know what happened to all that real estate, Lester? All that downtown property Bell has title on? Fuck no. Probably laughing his balls off right now. You, me, Daniels, all of us. You even pretending to speak for anyone other than yourself, McNulty? I'm speaking for the job. You want to talk about police work? I was doing the job when you was just dreaming on it. Daniels was out there too. Now you're gonna fuck him when he pulled you off a goddamn boat? He's a boss. Fuck the bosses. Maybe Daniels plays a few games to get by, but he's cost himself plenty for the sake of the job. He's earned some loyalty. Fuck loyalty and fuck you. I never thought I'd hear that chain of command horse shit come out of your mouth. Motherfucker, I spent a lot of time in a lot of weak units. More than you. Now, this here may not be perfect, but it's a chance to be police. Well, then be one. You're not even worth the skin off my knuckles, Junior. Jimmy, don't. You put fire to everything you touch, McNulty, then you walk away while it burns. I got nothing more to say to you. We were interested in um, the very few references to 9-11 in this, um, which we imagine that we're right now a couple months after September um, in the time frame of the story. We shot that in November? November. Am I right about that? November, yeah, we were yeah. a couple months after 9-11. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we were guessing because the Justice Department hadn't even regrouped seriously yeah. and issued any more... Um, uh, mandates, but one thing was clear is, you know, there's only like 12,000 FBI agents in the country, which if you think about the size of the country is relatively small. And they, they got into drug enforcement um, in 82 extremely reluctantly. So Ed, knowing this and, and, and me having covered it, we, we guessed pretty easily that the first thing that was going to get tossed by the FBI out of their mission, now that they were going to have to reassign, you know, two, three, four, five thousand of, the, of those 12,000 agents to counter terrorism, they were going to drop drugs in a heartbeat. There, there were going to be no more FBI drug cases moving to U.S. attorney's offices anywhere in the country. Yeah. And, and three months after we filmed this, <laughs> that, yeah. that, so we, we guessed right. But yeah. yeah, I mean, it was just a reaction to the, how is this, what's the country going to be feeling about the drug war yeah. when this thing airs several months from now? And, and I thought, we, I thought we, we caught it pretty well. You got something so important, man, you can't go through the proper channels. Well, no, I don't know. I just figured if I told anybody but you, you might think I'm riding a rock. Well, what makes me think you ain't? Yeah, right, that's a good point. Look, today, me, Tucky, Lil Mikey, man, we all, a bunch of us got scooped up by the police. Well, you shouldn't sell drugs. All right, all right. Nah, see, they didn't take us to the station. They took us down to the bottom of Vincent Street, where all the houses is boarded up, and they let us out. And then, on top of all of that, like, the whole while, they was being all, like, decent and shit. And you know that fucked me up. And then, like, the, the police chief, he come out, and, and this is the crazy part. He say that he got it set up to where we can sell stuff, certain spots, and the police won't bother us. I know, I know, it's fucked up. But I just thought you, you should know. I have to say, the, the show is really 
based on five or six prolonged investigations and, and, and innumerable characters that I reported on, but, but basically that Ed pursued. Everybody in ba Baltimore uh, knows, everybody uh, who's from the west side, they know who you're talking about, even though the names are all changed. So they, certain things come up or the way people say stuff or how people behave or certain murders, and they go, oh, you're doing Warren Bordley or you're doing this, and then you start hearing more stories. And then the real guys come around. I mean, the real Nathan Barksdale came around and we put him in the movie. He had a bit part in, 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 in one episode. And the real Melvin Williams came around after he'd been paroled. And, and now Melvin plays the deacon. Since I'm in New York, let me say it. Uh, there is no city more vain about its, about its position in popular culture, more, um, more indifferent to other realities, uh, more self-absorbed than New York City. Mm -hmm. I, mean, it's, it's, I mean, you guys have a lot going on, and there's a lot of wonderful stories to be told. But you literally think that you have the end thing to say, the nth degree of what to say on every single one of them. And Baltimore has 10 times your crime rate, five times your rate of, of intravenous drug addiction, five times your rate of poverty. And yet, because all the Wall Street money went here in the 80s and the 90s on that great run up, you know, and, and there is no more, you know, hell in Alphabet City and Morningside Heights is being gentrified. And, I mean, Manhattan is one big pile of money. And so you guys think you know urban America, you don't know shit anymore. I'm starting to get a little bit pissed off and I don't mean to be, but. <laughs> Why New York? There must be something happening out there, man. Too big a town, you know what I mean? You don't believe in the truth? That's why I asked for that money. Now, if he'd have said, man, we ain't paying you, just be happy to live, I'd have been like, all right, they're keeping it real. When he said, come on down for $5,000, like, man, please. <laughs> hey, look at Holmes, I ain't asked for much, but, um, I'm a little light on traveling money. I'm saying I could go around the block and get myself paid, but I'm thinking. You keep in touch with my pager. I'm gonna need you for the Gantt trial. Go easy, Omar. Stay free. When Homicide was published as a book, it was the only time they ever, you know, I, it's not because I'm a great guy, it's because I got to, they let me in the homicide unit for a year. I was really lucky. But this book comes out, and the New York Times would not review it at first, because they said it was a regional book. The, the New Yorker actually did a long review, and then they came back and, and wrote a little brief this big. But we've always had that problem in Baltimore. There is a tonality to how you guys accept stories that, that, it, that, that cover of the New Yorker where, you know, it's like, you know, New Jersey and then China. That, that is you, and, and an, awful, an awful lot of um, really fine storytelling does not permeate. And what's going on in Baltimore is that we've been just doing it so long, and we have so many hours of television under our belt that eventually enough people have found it that, you know, we can't go away anymore. But um, th there really is, it's a very hard piercing the New York LA access, and it's very hard for anything to be good because everybody who is writing is writing what they know. And what the hell do you know if you're, you know, I mean, God bless Richard Price, because he lives in Manhattan, but he actually crosses the river to go to, to uh, uh, Jersey City. I mean, that's why Clockers is so good, is he left the fucking island. <laughs> and, and, and I gotta say, you know, it's all the shows that look like LA and New York, I mean, I've gone off now, I've really, I've lost <laughs> it. Okay. But, I mean, you know, let me, here's a, here's a fact, this is an honest to God fact. Last year, there were more corpses on the three Law & Order franchises, which are all set in Manhattan. There were more dead people shown on that show than there were actual homicides in Manhattan. <laughs> I have stories that um, matter to me because of what I saw when I was a reporter and, what I, you know, and where I live. And the other writers also, you know, it's not a one-man band. I mean, there's a lot of good writers on the show. And we're all a little bit angry, and we're all just trying to get, pull the story through the keyhole, and we're sort of like amazed we can get it on American television. That's the beauty of HBO is, you know, they're, real, they're not, they're like, they know there's no, ha they know the show now, they know there's no happy endings coming. <laughs> um, and they're not telling us, you know, can you lighten it? That's what they used to tell us on Homicide. They used to say, you know, can't there be more life-affirming moments? <laughs> they did. And it's like, the show's called Homicide, you know? Um, but the Tom used to have those fights, not me. That was above my head. Most of the best cops I knew didn't think the drug war was winnable, even while they were doing really good police work. 
Um, and yet, if you ask most Marines um, who, who are in Fallujah, um, what, what they value, they value their units, they value their, the people that they're serving with. Um, you know, uh, the, the people find dignity in, in small non-political places where they can carve out, you know, uh, moments for themselves. We all do that. But I think the country's going to hell. <laughs> Everybody in West Baltimore has HBO. Okay, and I'm not kidding. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, families that are struggling, it's like, you know, do I pay the BG&E bill or do I pay Comcast? I'm paying Comcast because, you know, <laughs> it's unbelievable. It doesn't follow that, uh, that cable TV or premium cable is a high-end, is, a, is, a, is like a classist thing. It really doesn't. Um, maybe it should, but may, maybe it should be the last thing. But I can't help that. It's not like I, I'm not trying to make it for premium cable, but premium cable is the only one willing to do a story this dark. Um, not even, not even uh, like Fox or, or FX or, you know, not even basic cable will touch these themes. It's like too complicated. It's, you know, they, they know they're not going to get the viewership they want. And they don't care about what the critics say. So it's this little niche. Thank God it exists. It's like this little thing that developed because of Oz, because HBO um, came to the point of saying, you know what? We have to do TV that no one else has. We can't compete with the broadcast people for, you know, shoot them up, bang them up. We got we to gotta have something they don't. And so all of their shows go to a place that, um, or try to go to a place uh, that is different from television. Um, that, I mean, that, that, that HBO, it's not television thing, you can laugh at it a lot at this point. It's a very old, hackneyed phrase at this point. But it's sort of true when it comes to what their intent is. And I wish they beamed it into everybody's house for free, but, you know, that's not the economic model that allows it to survive. Without it, it would all be moronic. The whole box would be, you know, I, I know I wouldn't be in television.